uh, topic, intelligence, is a super controversial one. It's actually more controversial than it should be, but nonetheless it is. Um, and this is part of, uh, also part of unit five for cognition. This is the last part though. Is intelligence, and then the next double page, of course, is about intelligence tests. So, intelligence. One of the reasons why this is so controversial, the topic, is the results have indicated that it's largely genetic for the most part. But there's some important reasons why that it's we shouldn't just take that as a sign we can't do anything because we can, uh, and, and we'll, we'll talk about exactly how. So. What I'm trying to say here is just because you're born with a certain capacity uh, doesn't mean you should give up or lose hope or whatever. Uh, there is actually a good reason why you want to pursue maximizing it. So we'll talk about that here. So intelligence, first of all, this is the most studied topic in all of psychology uh, as far as thoroughness. It's 120 plus years here of solid scientific study. Uh, it's going way back. Uh, actually, it's more than... Now, it's not quite 130 years, but since at least the 1890s, they've seriously looked into this, uh, and they've refined it to the point that we pretty clearly understand at least how to predict it and, and what it is. So, first of all, intelligence itself is, <coughs> of course, an arbitrary term, uh, but it's intended to try to figure something out specifically. We're looking for a certain set of characteristics in somebody that we can identify at an early age and see if that translates to adulthood, uh, if that's consistent. And we have largely done that. So here's what intelligence kind of is. Uh, it's basically the ability <coughs> to analyze, observe, and process uh, patterns and knowledge Uh, for, for what purpose? I've told you this a couple times before. So part of it, the first part of it is being able to see, understand, and process what's going on, whether it's knowledge-based or it's pattern-based or whatever. And what, what's the purpose of me doing this? It's not like you can adapt. Okay, adapt to what? To like your surroundings in different situations. Okay, yeah. Uh, it, it's based on using the information, essentially. Okay, so first step is Ability to analyze, observe it, and patterns and knowledge. So you're gonna be able to take that all and understand it. Uh, secondly, you have to be able to take that knowledge you have and using logical deduction and rationality, try to apply that to the real world. So second step is uh, uh, using logical analysis slash rationality to uh, make predictions. All right, and that's largely what you're trying to do. You're trying to make predictions, and then uh, the accuracy of those predictions uh, is an indication that you have correctly identified some phenomena in the world, whether it's physical universe or it's social interaction uh, or whatever it might be. It could be a mechanical problem, it could be a, 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 a macro uh, view problem, like you know, on the scale of continents moving in tectonic plates, all the way down to you know the behavior of atoms and subatomic particles. So, uh, and, and you know, big as far as the size of the entire universe. So. Uh, that's what we, we are trying to do. So it's kind of a three-step process, and of course, uh, you want to make accurate, uh, reliable predictions. <coughs> so it's largely based around problem solving. So you have to understand how something works, then try to, uh, so you gotta take in the information, tr try to predict it by using your logical, logical, uh, logical and rational faculties and then try to make that accurate prediction. If your prediction is accurate consistently, you've figured the thing out, all right? And that, that is a, a kind of a three-step sequence to intelligence. Now you can uh, apply that in many different ways because you're like, well, how does spelling enable me to solve problems? Well, we need to learn to read and write so that we can take in the information and use it for these processes, all right? But that's ultimately what we're looking for. So that's kind of our, uh, uh, our skill or set of skills that we, what we mean when we talk about intelligence. All right, so that is essentially, I should do one, two, three, not arrows. That is essentially what intelligence is. All right, so the definition might be a little different, but that's pretty much what you're doing. Whether it's taking knowledge and experience or whatever, but you're using the information to solve problems, make predictions, et cetera. All right, because the whole point is 
find out what's going on and figure out how to manipulate it. And manipulate isn't necessarily a bad thing, by the way. Manipulate means you could change it to get the outcome you desire. Could my outcome be a good outcome? Mm -hmm. Could it be a bad outcome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be malicious, trying to harm people and harm things, absolutely, but it could also be, and usually is, uh, for the benefit of at least myself or others around me or, or the world as a whole. All right, that's intelligence. Uh, and again, we've been looking at this really, really thoroughly for over 120 years, uh, and there's not another topic we know more about than any other. All right, so uh, the findings have shown again that uh, intelligence is a largely uh, genetic ability. So for example, uh, it runs in families. If my parents are intelligent, I'm much more likely to be intelligent. Uh, if my siblings are, if I'm an identical twin that's intelligent, I'm extremely likely to be intelligent as well. Um, it's rare that it just randomly pops up. It can, different you know, gene combinations work together between different people, um, but for the most part, it's uh, largely genetic. And you know this right off the bat, you can even see this in infants uh, as far as their ability to process the information and uh, quickly use it to uh, predict and uh, act in the world. Uh, and again, you can see that as early as two months potentially. Uh, one of the first indicators you look for is uh, uh, eye contact. If kids are like looking towards uh, things that are making noise, especially humans that are talking, and maintaining that eye contact, that ability to analyze the source and focus on that source and process it is generally a pretty good indicator that your kid's gonna be on the average to more above average intelligence side. Uh, it's not a determining factor. It doesn't mean that, oh, he didn't, he's doomed or she's doomed, but uh, it's a pretty good, pretty reliable set of signs. There's other signs too, like uh, how early they acquire language, uh, how quickly they figure out really basic things like identifying objects, uh, attaching meaning to them, uh, you know, using, manipulating objects to get what they want. Like one of the earliest things is uh, when they take two objects and smack them together to make a sound they want to hear. You know, just things like that. Or that things are, if you put it under a rug, it doesn't just disappear. You, you can actually pull it back from under the rug and things like that. Um, so the earlier they do those compared to other kids is usually a pretty good sign. But again, um, there are exceptions where people are late on that and they end up being uh, pretty intelligent or vice versa, but it's, it's not as common. All right, if that makes sense. So, uh, largely genetic, and, uh, and we do know this, and we'll talk more about them when we get to intelligence testing. Um, this isn't the only thing that will dictate your success in the world, how intelligent you are, but if there's any one factor that does predict your success, and I mean like overall happiness, economic success, relationship success, et cetera, uh, it is intelligence. And they, uh, there is a correlation coefficient of 0.6 uh, between intelligence and uh, life, uh, life success and quality. Uh, wait, I'm going back to our old experimental psych. What is a correlation coefficient? What does 0.6 mean? <clears throat> You're all like, damn it, I have no clue. I was just going to gloss over that and ignore it. Yep, so it's 0. 0.6. What's that tell me? That's pretty high. Pretty high. What would be the highest? It would be a 1, a flat 1. All right? And it's not a negative number, so what does that mean? It's positive. But what does it mean if they're positively correlated? Scary, they're both going up together or they're both going down. Yep, they both go up together or both go down together. They do the same thing. All right? If it's negatively correlated, it means they do the opposite. All right, so this means that uh, the correlation coefficient between intelligence and life success, and again, we found pretty accurate measures for that as far as enjoyment of life, happiness, life quality, um, income, things like that, all lumped together. Uh, it's about a 0. 0.6, and that's a really high correlation. Notice it's not a one, though, so it's not determinist. right? There's another 0. 0.4 in there, uh, or more than 0. 0.4, but there's another uh, uh, set of factors that uh, uh, play into it, but it's the single highest uh, factor. All right. Next, uh, below that, is there's about a 0.3 uh, correlation coefficient between uh, conscientiousness, and I'll, I'll briefly tell you what that is, conscientiousness, uh, and uh, life success. Another word for this some people use is uh, grit, which is basically like your perseverance and discipline. Um, conscientiousness is a personality characteristic or factor that we'll talk about in unit seven, but to sum it up basically, 
conscientious people are very orderly, so they're organized, they're focused, uh, and they're productive and driven, so they're disciplined. So these are people that like, if it doesn't work the first time, they don't go, oh, damn it, and give up. They kind of persist. Uh, that's kind of what grit is, is, is persisting towards your goal despite um, adversity. So uh, conscientiousness is the second highest predictor of success. So again, intelligence isn't the only thing, but it's the most, uh, has the highest correlation coefficient, essentially. Does that make sense? All right. Um, so uh, the reason why, well, can you tell me why? I just gave you some information. This is kind of what we define intelligence as. That's a generally agreed upon um, definition, by the way. There are some people disagree, we'll, we'll talk about that. But my ability to take information, use it logically, make accurate predictions, solve problems, right? Uh, it's largely genetic, and it's the biggest factor, not the only, but the biggest factor in determining life success. Why might that be controversial? Oh, yep, yeah, why would this be a controversial thing? Because it's, at this point, it's essentially a fact. <clears throat> is it because some people, like their parents, might not have had the best intelligent, like upbringing? They might have not went to college, for example. Like okay. Some people, um, like they're the first generation that's going to college, but their um, offsprings are intelligent and they do go to college, so it could be controversial. Oh, there's actually a reason why I can explain that. I think you're, I don't want to interrupt you, but keep going. But yeah, that's why some people might believe it's not genetically, like largely genetically affected. Okay. Of their, yeah, uh, their uh, there have been people that have made statements like that. So you're saying if I uh, am a, let's say I'm a low middle class or a, a poor class, group in a country or, or I'm, an, I'm a new immigrant coming from a country that is a generally a poor country. Parents aren't educated, uh, but then they send their kid to college and they grow up here in the United States or Europe or wherever and then they end up being incredibly intelligent. They say, look, see, that's not, an, that's not genetically linked. Um, there is actually um, good evidence that it is though. It's just that the parents weren't raised in a, an environment that allowed them to uh, learn things and educate because you need to be educated to actually realize your intelligence. So what they would say is they already had the genetic capacity, but they were never given the opportunity to, to use it and develop with it. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk more about that shortly though. But yeah, you're right. Uh, part of the reason why they don't like that is uh, it's kind of, they say it is deterministic, meaning uh, if you don't get the genes, you don't get it. And people generally don't like that. Why don't people like that? So yes, the genetic part is the controversial part. Why don't people like that? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, that's what people really don't like hearing. They don't like hearing that you have, uh, that there's a cap, essentially, that you, there's a limit. Uh, they like to think that uh, your environment and uh, your upbringing would be the biggest determining factor in intelligence, that like anyone can be intelligent. And fortunately, that's not true. And that's the part that people can't stomach for the most part. So understand that going forward. Uh, this is all, and this isn't just me, guys. This is in my opinion. This is what the statistics of 120 years plus of intelligence and intelligence testing work tell us. This isn't like, I think this. This is what the data tells us, uh, is it is mostly genetic. Uh, and that is what upsets people. Because then I have no chance to improve whatever my um, uh, cap might be. It's like that's what the cap is. Uh, most people don't accept that. Why though, by the way? Because we've actually talked about this too. Why do people not like genetic or biological explanations for, for my behavior or ability? There's a certain reason why they're so opposed to it. It's important to understand why, because they have some valid reasons. Is it because um, people later use it to like, justify, like, like, for example, like the Nazis who say that the Aryan people are smarter and that's why the, like, they deserve yeah, exactly. Uh, people are, are deathly afraid, and rightfully so, uh, that this information could be used to uh, uh, justify eugenics, right, which is uh, denying some people uh, the right to reproduce and giving it to others who might be deemed more fit, or applying it to groups and wiping them out based on race or, or ethnicity or, or social class, because uh, there have been arguments for both, and we saw it in the Holocaust it, it actually get played out. Uh, so, yes, they have a, a good reason to oppose that, right? That's that whole blank slate topic we talked about before, how uh, 
when they embraced the uh, evolutionary genetic perspective, some radicals took that too far and, and applied that knowledge incorrectly, and we got some eugenics and genocidal disasters. So totally legit to be afraid of that, uh, but we have a much more nuanced understanding of that. So yeah, let's, let's get that, by the way. Uh, this is a, uh, it's highly controversial due to this fact mostly, and this too, that it's kind of deterministic, but number one reason why is they uh, oppose biological explanations uh, due to a, a legitimate, by the way, I'll put legitimate here, legitimate fear of eugenics uh, slash bigotry, maybe even genocide. Right, and we have, a, we have some evidence for that. We've seen the Holocaust, we've seen eugenics programs and sterilizations, like, those, are, those are very, very much bad things that we want to avoid. Okay, um, here's though an explanation as to why this is, uh, well this was definitely a mistake historically, uh, but why it shouldn't be looked at that way. And, and here, here's some examples. So when someone is born, do I know what their capability is? Let, let's say they do have a genetic cap and that looks like what is the case. They have kind of a cap to how intelligent they can or can't be. Do I know what everyone's is when they're born? Can I like, plug it in and be like, oop, your cap is this IQ. No. no, I don't know. So, number one reason why we this shouldn't be as much of a fear, or it shouldn't be uh, uh, this, I don't know how I can phrase it, this very pessimistic view is, number one, so uh, why not a concern, I guess would be the topic here. Uh, number one, we don't know your potential when you're born. We don't know uh, your potential. So let's just look at the individual right now. We're not going to talk about group stuff yet, which we'll get to for part two. And you already know the answer to that one, by the way. So number one, uh, I can actually fall short of my genetic cap based on my environmental factors. All right. So I am like, I might have this uh, uh, um, what's it, blueprint, right, or architecture, uh, but I can fall short of that, that maximum intelligence realizing that as far as brain development and knowledge goes. How might that occur, by the way? How, why is it people coming from poor countries tend to be much less intelligent than people from developed countries? And it's not because their genes are inferior. Um, because they can, um, tend to be malnourished or they don't have the like, um, needed like, nutrition to have. Like, exactly. Food. The biggest issue by far uh, is uh, you can fall short slash can fall short of cap or I'll say potential. Number one reason is uh, nutrition. All right, there was a, there's a video of like New York in 1912 and they put it in color. It looks super cool now, like HD, 4K, all that. Everyone's so much shorter. And I can tell you this too, everyone's intelligence was lower compared to now. So the, the two reasons are the same. It's uh, first of all, they're shorter because they aren't getting as much nutrition as we all get. So they're not realizing their, their growth potential uh, physically as far as height and stature goes. But the same applies uh, to their brains as well. So I'm not gonna get <clears throat> as much neural development, myelination activity if I am lacking nutrition at any point. So whether it means I'm actually technically starving, like not getting enough calories, or I'm not getting enough of the micronutrients I need to develop uh, normally, I'm gonna fall short, almost certainly gonna fall short of my intelligence cap. So that's definitely one reason why we should never assume an individual is not gonna be uh, smart or intelligent. Uh, at the beginning, you have to let them realize what their potential is. And if you cut them short on nutrition, certainly, uh, that's going to uh, cut their intelligence short as well. So uh, nutrition deprivation key for development. What else is somebody gonna need to uh, realize their potential? Nutrition's probably the biggest one, but you could argue this one's just as big, this next one. I'll give you money for that before I forget. What else you got? Um, education. Yes, you actually have to be educated to some extent, all right? You have to learn to read and write, you have to take in a bunch of information because I could be the smartest person on earth as far as figuring things out, but if I go my whole life and uh, I'm only living in, you know, one town and I don't have the internet or something like that, am I gonna be able to learn about all the cool things about mechanics and psychology? Am I gonna be able to figure that out throughout my life on my own? Some of you are like, I don't know, are you? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, why is it that you're able to know so much at this age? 
So you're all 16, 17 ish. <clears throat> you're all pretty smart for a 16 or 17 year old. You wouldn't be this smart if you were just off in some village by yourself uh, with, with like 50 people. Why is that? Um, well, it's because it's, you're constantly getting knowledge of, um, how would I say it? Like for subjects like science and math, you're, yes. you're learning how to read and write. Yeah, okay, so you're learning how to apply these things, but also, am I borrowing the knowledge that other people found? Yes, right? This stuff would take them potentially years to figure out, and I could just tell it to you in 10 seconds. So you're basically compacting all the information uh, that's already been found out by other people. And there's way more information already than you could ever hope to know. But uh, the fact that you're able, you have access to this, to learn how to analyze and critically think and read and write, and then you're able to take in information that people took years to develop and you learn it in just you know a few minutes, uh, that's greatly going to increase your capacity uh, for intelligence. Uh, and like we talked about with, uh, with creativity and problem solving, sometimes all you need is a different perspective on how to approach a problem, and all of a sudden you can solve way more problems just by knowing how to think differently uh, about it. Uh, so that you can also borrow from other people too. So you absolutely need the access uh, to education, to info, and particularly formal education. And that's where you learn that. Okay, that's super important because if you don't grow up with that, you're not going to uh, reach your potential, absolutely. All right, and then there's possibly one more factor I could say, and I need this factor to get these two. This is a little more difficult to get, I think, anyway. Let me get you money before I forget, though. What you got? Um, uh, economic and political stability. Yes, nailed it. If I don't have economic and political stability, I don't get these in the first place, right? There's a reason why developing nations you know, ones with agricultural-based economies that don't have stable governments or thriving market economies. Uh, there's a reason why people there are less intelligent. And again, it's not the genes. It's because they either don't get the nutrition or they don't have education because there's not a stable enough economic political system to, uh, to facilitate that. All right, so you need that political economic stability and growth uh, to even have access uh, to these things. So the environment is quite important, not quite as much uh, it's in a different way than we think, but if I'm gonna reach whatever my maximum you know, potential is, I can only achieve that if I have these factors. And if I don't, I will definitely fall short of my uh, potential. So that's how we know, because we, we can see this is called the Flynn effect, by the way, we'll get to it later. Um, as countries get more developed and they get access to these things, the average IQ for their citizens goes up uh, pretty constantly. It's kind of flattening out in most developed nations, uh, but, the fact that uh, you start so low because you're lacking these things environmentally, uh, and you, as you get them, people are able to realize their potential, your population's intelligence just goes up uh, across the board over time. All right, and we've seen that happen uh, in every country. Uh, they start low and they work their way up when these factors are all consolidated. Okay, so that's really important. Uh, that's a really important factor when considering why isn't it isn't so, what's the word I'm looking for? pessimistic or, or, or foolish to think that, oh, uh, my genes determine my intelligence. Because no, if you don't have these factors, then you're definitely not going to realize whatever your cap is. And we don't even know what your cap is. Uh, so we should never deny someone the chance to pursue that. Uh, so that kind of erases that explanation, I guess you could say. All right. Um, how about this one? What if, because that's, that's on the individual level, right? So that's why I shouldn't just judge a baby and then cut them off because I don't know what pace they're going to develop at and there's these factors to consider as well. What about when like the Nazis applied this to groups, right? And they said, oh, well, these groups and civilizations uh, have lower IQs and they uh, are less economic, uh, economically successful. Therefore, their whole race is genetically inferior and we should uh, um, exterminate them or get rid of them uh, or applying to classes too, because they applied this to class and um, uh, race. So this was applied to groups in two ways, uh, racially, and we all know the Nazis, and what they did with that. But they also did it based on class. Um, there was, if you've had a push, you guys ever heard of the gospel of wealth? Yeah. None of you have. That's weird. I would think that you have, would have, but okay. Maybe you haven't gotten to it yet. I hope that's what it is. So. Uh, there's a concept called the Gospel of Wealth. It was uh, an essay written by Andrew Carnegie. So this is back in the day of like social Darwinism uh, when they just wanted 
the successful to be successful without stopping them. And if everyone got stomped on, too bad. Why did they say too bad, by the way? Because they were, they were just going to let whatever corporation or person get as rich and wealthy and powerful as they wanted, and they weren't going to be concerned about uh, the poor. Why, why, why did they believe that was an okay thing? In fact, they actually believed, not that it was okay, that that was a good thing. Exactly, or, or if they let them go, it would bring down everybody else. Like, Hitler thought that allowing other races to come in uh, would bring down uh, Germans. Or, in the case of classes, that helping out the poor would just take away from the ability of the uh, uh, gifted um, and their resources that could make humanity better. So in both cases, right, and this would be a good example of a gospel of wealth. In both cases, though, we would say this is social Darwinism or imperialism, where it basically justified uh, this race or this class is inferior uh, genetically, therefore it is okay, in fact it's a good thing to allow the dominant races or the dominant people and classes uh, to dominate the poor or the uh, uh, less successful because it's evolution, all right? They wanted to uh, wipe out the inferiors and promote the superiors, uh, at least people they believe were superior. Uh, by either you know genocide and sterilization, or just not helping the poor out and allowing the rich to to uh, dominate. Right. That's the back. That's back the 19th, early 20th centuries with monopolies and cronyism and all that a push U.S. history stuff that that you probably forgotten or didn't even hear. Uh, nonetheless, uh, those are two reasons to be afraid of all this. Why is that wrong though? So we, hold on. We got this part individually. Why you should never deny someone the opportunity because we don't know their potential. Why is this wrong though? Why is saying this group is genetically inferior to this group? And I mean like whites, blacks, Asians, whatever, Jews, uh, or it could be you know the rich and the, the poor classes. Why is that wrong? Why is that a fallacy? Totally incorrect. And actually your early example is a good example of this. Because they're labeling them, like separating them? That's true, they're labeling them and that's, that's dangerous. But I'm saying why is it wrong? I don't mean morally wrong, like technically wrong. Why are they incorrect in saying that this is true and that's what we should do? So there's no question it's morally wrong, like wiping people out, denying them existence. Why is it actually technically wrong? It does. So that's the first one we've talked about before, right? Why did uh, European and Asian civilizations do better or at least innovate faster than the rest of the world? Yeah, exactly. They're much more interconnected and access to resources, right? And if, you, if I drew the continents up here, Sub-Saharan Africa, pretty much cut off from the rest of the world by the desert. Uh, the uh, islands of Indonesian archipelago, Australia, cut off from the rest of the world by water. Um, the Americas, uh, whether well, it's North America, South America, cut off from the rest by water, but also they were North and South oriented. So I didn't have animals and crops that could go all over the place because they would die in the heat or the cold. So people generally stayed in very small knit areas. All right, Afro Eurasia or sorry, uh, Eurasia though plus North Africa, that's all interconnected by uh, ste steppe regions east to west. So I have the same animals and crops that can work across the uh, uh, entire continent. Uh, I have civilizations that can travel much easier across the steppes and waterways there. They have natural waterways that allow you to move much more easily. So it just shared, they shared more ideas. So the reason why Europe and these Asian communities happen to do better, it wasn't because they were racially superior. Uh, it was actually just because they had more access to information than Sub-Saharan Africa or Oceania uh, or the uh, North and South Americas, those civilizations. So again, not genetic superiority, it was just geography and access to information. And we actually know this is true, by the way, because if this was true, when we brought people over from those countries or we brought these factors to those the areas, <clears throat> they wouldn't do as well. But guess what happens when uh, Asians or Africans or Latin Americans or Oceanians have this stuff? Guess what happens to their intelligence? Yeah, it goes right up to where everybody else is for the most part, right? Because humans are different a little bit based on skin and, and, and shape and things like that. And there's tiny little genetic differences. But as far as intelligence capacity goes, there's no known difference uh, on individual level. Uh, so as long as they have access to these things, any group has been capable of producing individuals that are highly intelligent. All right. 
So that's why that one is absolutely wrong, is uh, they had an incorrect explanation as to why certain civilizations did better. Uh, what about this poor thing, though? This middle class, poor class uh, doing better than, uh, than the other, traditionally? Because it's not as much the case anymore. Um, kind of like the racial factor. Um, people that have more money and richer were able to get better education and have better resources. And um, poor people, like, had to do work, so they didn't have time for education. Yeah, that's certainly how it starts off, yeah. So whether I'm a poor person in the 19th century, early 20th century, or maybe I'm a new immigrant coming in from a, a, a poor nation, my parents do not have access to nutrition and education, so are they gonna realize their maximum potential? Absolutely not. They, they, they may look stupid or less intelligent to you even though they're necessarily not. So they might have that genetic capability of being smart, but their environment denied that to them. Whether they were raised in a rural or poor area in the United States, like in the, uh, uh, there were, there were like, for example, uh, uh, to kind of throw the racial thing out the window, there were a whole bunch of like Italian, Irish, Scottish immigrants that would come over with really low intelligence for a while. But as soon as they got into the American system uh, and assimilated and, and benefited from the nutrition education, they all caught up. Even though their group IQs were lower, they caught up as soon as they uh, were able to enjoy the same environment as um, other you know, white Americans that had already been there. Same for racial groups too. You coming from Latin America or Asia or Africa, you see these people come in with parents that are lower intelligence, not because they're genetically inferior, but because they didn't have these factors growing up. And when their kids get put into the system, they get nutrition education, their IQ scores are right up there with everybody else's. All right, so um, when you look at group IQs being higher or lower than others, whether it's blacks or Asians or, or, or Europeans or whatever, and there are some differences by group, there's not by individual. Uh, and the group differences can largely be explained by uh, this. Uh, once those groups are able to access uh, these features of nutrition, education, and stability, uh, every human for the most part has the same capacity uh, as far as populations go. So there is no even if you look at IQ figures and see that one group is doing better than the other, it's almost purely <clears throat> having to do with these factors. They're not assimilated into society. They're not uh, benefiting from the nutrition and the education of a stable uh, economic and political system. So both of these are out. <clears throat> so that does help us not worry about this as much. And now you guys know that. Uh, but just know that going forward, you're going to hear a lot of people that are resistant to this idea of, of uh, genetic intelligence and things like that but uh, it's way more nuanced than that. And yes, these were legitimate problems and fears, but these were technically wrong. Uh, their, their application of their knowledge to these groups uh, or people was incorrect, and we know that. When you give people these factors growing up and they're able to develop normally, uh, there's no one race that like, you know, way outpaces the other. Uh, the only exception to that for whatever reason is um, uh, there's, a, there's a Jewish population in Europe known as Ashkenazi Jews, uh, they, for whatever reason, have an IQ that's uh, like 10 to 15 points higher than uh, the, other, the other groups for whatever reason. Uh, but that's a small group, <clears throat> it's a small subset. Um, but that's really the only one that we can point to that's like, that one might be a little bit different, maybe. Um, but regardless, uh, everyone has the capacity, or every race and group and, and class has the capacity potential to do it, uh, they just have to be shown that. There is genetic cap per person, but no one group, uh, uh, et cetera, is better or, or should be denied because we don't know. We don't know what your potential is, and you have to have these factors to get there. And that explains why some groups have lagged behind across time. All right. So if anyone gets all racist or classist on you, put them in their damn place. Uh, let them know why uh, certain civilizations did better, and let them know why certain groups have historically done better because they didn't have access to these. All right. So. Now that we know that, hopefully that's kind of quelled some of your questions and or fears. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about intelligence before we take our break in like 15 minutes. Um, there's kind of two types-ish, or there's two ways to look at it. So um, there's how much information I know, like facts I could tell you, like, oh, here are all the countries of the world, and here's all the governments and things like that. That's the knowledge I've accrued, just kind of factual information. But, and I, I, you can teach people that, correct? You can. There's also a term referred to, so that's crystallized intelligence. All right, let me get that up here. I'm running out of room already. Uh, I'll put it up here. So intelligence, there's kind of two ways to measure it. There's crystallized, 
And if you can think of that like it actually is a solid crystal, like it, it, it's there, you have to essentially make it to make it solid. It's a thing you can, can access. Crystallized intelligence is uh, like all of your knowledge and experience that you've uh, acquired. So knowledge, experience, achievement essentially. So what I've learned, all right? So that's why you can do well on a test uh, that's based on information you've already been taught. All right, so like when we have those quizzes, that's almost all crystallized intelligence because you didn't know it the week before and you've learned it and now you know it. It's like basically facts and concepts. You guys got that? That one makes sense? Okay, so that's just knowledge you've taken in and remembered and you can now uh, use. That's crystallized intelligence. The next one is a concept called fluid intelligence. What might be the difference between the two? This is stuff I know. What would fluid intelligence be? I can't teach fluid intelligence. I can teach you crystallized intelligence. I can't teach you fluid intelligence. It's how you're, it's how you're able to learn. Quickly. Yeah, it's your capacity to learn and the speed at which you can learn. Capacity and speed at which you learn. Okay, so that's my problem solving ability basically. All right, if I give you guys a bunch of puzzles and uh, patterns and things you have to figure out, I might be able to teach you some new ways of looking at it, but your ability to take that information and figure it out and find the solution and the speed you can do that, that's largely your fluid intelligence. Uh, that's the one that's the most genetic as far as factors go. All right, uh, so if I have a really high IQ, I have a high fluid intelligence. Uh, almost certain. In fact, I would say certain. And these, of course, uh, that's correlated also with working memory, if you guys remember. The ability to like talk and think and kind of keep this little store bank of info in the short term uh, and use it in your discussion or understanding. Uh, that's basically uh, your IQ, your ability. So, does this, do you think, across a lifetime, many years, affect that? The ability at which I can understand to learn things, is that going to affect how much I can know in total mm -hmm. after a few years. Yeah. Yes, it does, right? So that's why most people that have high IQs or fluid intelligence, if you check in later, they usually know more things just in general because they can, they, they see them and take them in, process them and remember them uh, more effectively and sometimes they're more interested in doing that uh, than people who are not. Does that mean though that every person that has a high fluid intelligence has high crystallized intelligence? Mm -hmm. No, why not? Well, yeah, that's true. But it's actually different than just forgetting it. Because part of fluid intelligence is actually remembering it, too. Because even though you have, like, a high capacity or speed at learning things, you can choose not to learn. Exactly. If I'm not interested in learning, and all I want to do is play a video game for the rest of my life, am I going to accrue a lot of knowledge and crystallized intelligence? Nope, I might know a ton about that game, but I'm not gonna know much about uh, something else. So this is the reason why I wanna, I wanna get, get this point across to you that it's not, you're not doomed if your IQ is not as high as you want it to be. Uh, because you can actually apply this uh, grit and conscientiousness across time. So let's say I've got an unmotivated, highly intelligent person with an IQ or high fluid intelligence, and I've got a, uh, or I said, I'm gonna say unmotivated. Did I say, did I say unmotivated? Yeah. Okay, good. An unmotivated, person with high fluid intelligence and a very motivated person with average or even maybe a little below average fluid intelligence. If uh, the below average fluid intelligence person like really attempts to learn a lot as much as they can and works hard towards it across years, they're definitely going to know more uh, than the uh, fluid intelligence person who has high fluid intelligence but doesn't like want to learn things and doesn't have a lot of drive. All right, so that's why this is actually uh, the second highest factor is if I'm motivated and organized and I pursue it and, and I apply that grit that, you know, face pursuing despite adversity, that can actually get me quite a ways, all right? So even if you find yourself lower on the IQ uh, percentile spectrum than you want, uh, you can apply uh, discipline, organization, uh, and grit to uh, get much further than you could if you didn't, all right? So that's why uh, you should know the difference between the two and uh, know that just because this isn't as high as you want it to be, it doesn't mean this can't be um, high across the long term. The only disadvantage you would have is if somebody who is equally motivated has a higher fluid intelligence, 
yeah, across time, they're gonna get more than you would. But still, I can tell you this right away, most people aren't high in fluid intelligence and motivated. So it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous person when they are, but there's not many of them, all right? Because first of all, there's not many people with really high fluid intelligence, and then if you take that population and you find the group that's also motivated, it's an even smaller chunk. So there's not much competition. Uh, but man, when they have both those things put together, they're pretty dangerous. That's the, that, that's the uh, um, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos's, Bill Gates, uh, Elon Musk's of the world. Uh, any academic that puts out like, you know, tons and tons and tons of papers and books across their lifetime. Those are the guys and girls that you have no chance of beating, but that's fine. Nobody does because they're uh, technically freaks as far as how high intelligence and motivation is for both for for them. All right, but that's why they, that's why they're the ones that find all this stuff out and make billions of dollars, and make our world better because uh, they're the actual, uh, and I mean this in a good way, freaks of the world as far as their abilities. All right, uh, so that's kind of how the two work together. And uh, if I wanted to test these things, I actually can. I do want to bring this up while it's fresh in our memory. Uh, this type of chest, chest, this type of a test would be an achievement test, like what I've already memorized and known. This would be what's called an aptitude test. So this is my knowledge, what I've accomplished. This is my, I should put a test next to it. This is my capability, my skill, my potential. All right. Uh, so again, you can look for those uh, in kids or even teenagers. Uh, and if they are figuring things out quicker than other people their age, they probably have a pretty high fluid intelligence. All right. Let's talk about the specific theories then. So uh, when we talk about tests, we'll get, we'll get another set of people and times. But we'll start here with just people picking up on at least how to look at it and analyze it, some theories about how it might work. All right. This goes back quite a ways. Um, there was, there's a few people. There's Charles Spearman, Howard Gardner, uh, Robert Sternberg, getting the guy that's in between. I have his name here, just kiss it up for you so I don't forget. Daniel Goldman, there we go. Uh, so we'll start with Spearman. Uh, this is the early 1900s, the early 20th century. <clears throat> he developed a way to find, well, he first looked for what intelligence was, like how you could see it in somebody. Um, there's a more refined method uh, found by Leon Thurstone in the 1930s, I think. Uh, but they're basically looking for what causes intelligence. Like, so what ways can you look at it? So there's a few ways that you could look at it that, that Charles Spearman uh, notes out through a process called factor analysis. Oh, here's an example. Let's say I, uh, hmm. let's say I give you a few questions and I say things like, uh, I give you like a question like, okay, here's a triangle. Here's, you know, the, the uh, lengths of the triangle. You know, what's this? That's number one. Number two is just, you know, do some simple division like, well, not simple necessarily, but 128 divided by 57,867. And then I was like, number three here, I was like, uh, one of those word questions about, hello, a train traveling at blah, 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 from A to B at, whatever speed, uh, when will they arrive? And then I also have you do a question about, what's another type of math question? Uh, the area of the circle. Well, all right, I guess area is different. Yeah, so I say, what's the area of the circle? Here's the radius, you know, it's four or whatever. All right, are they all different problems? Yes. yes. But is there something in common all these problems have? Yes. What is that? Math. Yeah, math, right? Numerical ability, essentially. Okay, so he developed a way of looking for, well, anything, but first for intelligence, obviously, uh, by finding common factors. All right, so if I'm, good at, if I'm good, really good at this type of problem, am I probably also good at the other types? What do you think? Yes. Yeah, okay, there might be some variance on the word problems, but... Uh, for the most part, if I'm doing good on one of these, 
I also tend to do good on the other ones because they're all similar in nature. They have to deal with numbers and understanding uh, math or, or, or space, I guess. But space is actually a separate one. But yeah, that's what he's basically going to do. All right. Uh, let's say I um, give you another set of questions, uh, except these ones are different. Like one is uh, uh, explain intelligence. That's the problem I give you. Uh, the next one is uh, um, figure out oh, what what does um, circumvent mean. Then <clears throat> um, I take two words like. Uh, And I ask you, what's the relationship between those words? Are they the same? Are they the opposite? You know, that sort of thing. And then I take a word like, and I do, um, yeah, define, explain, or I do. And then I give you a poem, blah, 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 whatever it is. And then you tell me the uh, meaning of that poem. Poem or, or, or message, message of the poem. All right, that's four different questions. Are they all different questions? Yes. Okay. Is there something similar about them? Yes. What's common in all of these? Okay, well, there is some defining, right? There's explaining what intelligence is. That may not just be defined. That's actually explaining how, how it works. How? There we go. That's defining, that's explaining how something works. This is noting the difference uh, or similarities, similarities or difference between words, and that is interpreting uh, a, a, a piece of writing. So all this has to do with? Language, yeah, language and word use, right? So understanding uh, what words mean, how they work, how to interpret them, how to explain them. Those are all uh, essentially forms of verbal uh, communication or, or word fluency, all right? So do you think if... Obviously, you'd want more than four. You'd probably want 100 questions like this. But do you think that if I gave this test out, that if you're good at this, you're probably also about as good at these things here? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Probably. And in most cases, that's true. That's because uh, I'm not actually asking four different questions. I'm really asking one. It's basically, how well can you comprehend and use language? Right? That's pretty much what it is. They are different ways of doing it, I realize. But... To do all of these, I have to understand what these words mean and be able to express them uh, to you, essentially. All right? So that's all a, a, a one single factor. All right? Uh, so he developed a system known as factor analysis. So um, I don't know exactly all the categories he had individually. I know who Thurston does later. He has seven, but uh, let's just reduce to like three here. So there's numerical, uh, there's uh, word comprehension, fluency. Uh, let's say there's uh, memory, and then let's say there is, uh, what else would there be for him? Spatial. Like mentally rotating objects and figuring out distances and uh, knowing your orientation in the world and direction and reading maps and making maps and things like that. All right. Um, I could give you a 200 question test with questions that are have these factors in them, right? All kinds of different math questions, all kinds of different word meaning expression defined questions, all kinds of uh, uh, questions that have to deal with uh, you remembering something uh, or maybe a, a short list and then you have to tell me what was on that list. Uh, and then I could also have questions having to do with spatial as far as reading maps, making maps, knowing your direction, knowing spaces, uh, analyzing shapes, things like that. What do you think generally happens when somebody does well in one of these categories. So like, let's say I give the test out to everybody, same test, I score all of you, right? And you have certain percentages, and I've even, I've even found out which numbers uh, associate with each factor. Like, oh, okay, so one to 25 is this, and then 26 to 50 is that, and then 51 uh, to 75 is that, and then 76 to 100 is that. So I, I know exactly which factor is in all questions. I hand them out, I see all of your percentages, it comes back to me. Um, let's say, compared to everybody else, you do really well here. You're uh, at the top. By the way, the high, for percentiles, it's just your rank. 
If I get a 99th percentile, that doesn't mean I got 99% correct. What does that mean? Nope. Yeah, I got a higher score than everybody except one person, maybe. Right? So I'm the 99th highest score, essentially. What if I got an 18? Does that mean I got an F? Nope. It's not 18%. What does that mean? I'm ranked 18th out of every 100 people, essentially. So percentiles are your rank. So if I go take a test and get a 74, doesn't mean I got a C, that means I did better than 74 people or I'm the 74th highest performer, essentially. All right, so the higher number, the better. Let's say I got 91st percentile in questions one to 25. Yay you, you, out of 10 people, uh, out of 10 people, you uh, score better than nine of them on average, all right? Uh, or out of 100, you score better than 91 on average, if that makes it easier to understand. How do you think you generally do on the other ones? You probably did better than most people. You generally score pretty high on all the other ones as well, all right? So what he found was if I factor analyze, right, I take common types of questions, and I do vary the actual questions, but I find common types. People that score highly on one tend to also score highly on the other ones as well. Now that's not, I mean, they're all 91, but they'll be relatively close, like, oh, maybe their memory's in the 87th percentile, and their word fluency is in the 80, third percentile and their spatial intelligence is the 93rd percentile those are all relatively close all right and that's what that's what Spearman's going to find is if I give out a test however you perform in one whether it's high low or average you do pretty much the same in all categories all right so let's say you're on the average area which would be around 50 right that's the average dead in the middle right so oh, I was 51st in numerical then I'm probably going to be like I don't know 45th in word, uh, and then maybe 47th in memory, and then maybe 53rd in spatial. Nonetheless, doesn't matter what my actual score is, generally speaking, the score I get in one category, I also have a similar score in other categories. Are you with me on that? Okay, not exactly the same, but close to the same. So, what would this, uh, if, if you were Spearman and you did this experiment, and then you uh, came to that conclusion, you did your factor analysis, right, common question types, question Types. And you and you find this that almost all people do relatively the same in all categories. What does that tell you? Do you think about intelligence? Is there perhaps a single factor for intelligence if all of these are coming out the same? If I'm if I'm testing you for four different types of questions and your scores are the same on all of them, does that mean that intelligence is just comes at a package, like here it is, there's one factor that uh, controls how well uh, or determines how well I can do on math and language and spatial and memory. And like if you do well on one factor of intelligence, you probably like would do well on like the other categories. Yeah, that's exactly what it tells us. But what he theorizes is, and it's not quite correct, but it's kind of correct, is that there is uh, one general factor of intelligence. So he doesn't know what it is, but he's going to say, all right, when I test all these people, they uh, generally score the same in all factors, like uh, at least rank-wise, right? So they're really close. So what he theorizes is, and again, there's pretty good evidence for this, that there is a kind of general factor of intelligence, meaning if I'm, however I score in, in, in math or language or whatever it might be, I generally score similarly in the other categories. So I either get the high intelligence or the average intelligence or the low intelligence, or I, or I don't, essentially. It all kind of comes together. So he theorized that there's just really one factor uh, that it Im impacts your actual intelligence. So if I were to look at the brain, where do you think my intelligence is going to be dominant here as far as my finding patterns and logically assessing them and making predictions? Limbic system? Cerebellum? Frontal? Temporal lobe? Frontal, Frontal lobe, yeah. So most of it's here. I'm doing this for a reason, by the way, guys. So uh, there's your brain, kind of the oven mitt. Uh, most of this processing is going to go on there in your frontal lobe. All right. That's where your uh, problem solving is. That's where your creativity is. That's where you know a lot of your language uh, comprehension, expression is. Um, that's basically where you take this information in, analyze it logically, and then consciously act it out, trying to predict uh, what's gonna happen. That's why humans can do this stuff and other animals cannot, or at least not to the same degree that we can, all right? Um, and he's largely gonna be correct. And um, that's fine and well, I think this is a 1904, 
early 1900s regardless. Um, why don't people, some people like this explanation? By the way, he's not 100% right. It's important to note that. But for the most part, most people do seem to just kind of have an, an intellectual ability that is across the board, whether it's high, low, or average. Why might people not like this finding? Right, yeah, it's kind of um, sort of, it's kind of pessimistic, right? Like, I can't get any better. I either get it or I don't get it, as far as intelligence goes, right? And, and people do not like that. They like to think people can change and people can improve and all that. Uh, and we actually know that they can, right? If you deny people nutrition, uh, stable, stable state system and economy and then nutrition and uh, education, they won't reach it. Uh, so they do uh, need to, um, there are environmental, environmental factors though, but uh, there is kind of a, an inherent ability you get uh, that's in the frontal lobe. Now, here's, what, here's the complex thing that I want to mention, though. It's not just like one part of your brain. It's like, and my intelligence is right here. It's that part, and if that's damaged, I'm done. I can't figure any of this stuff out. That's not how it works. It's definitely a network, but the network is up here. All right, so whether it's the language expression centers in my broca, uh, or it's the ventral or uh, um, 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 dorsal medial uh, prefrontal cortex, or where or my fine motor skills, uh, wherever it might be, these are all interacting together. And for whatever reason, generally people, uh, all these circuits in their brains and regions, they generally have the same level of ability, but not always. So we'll, we'll find out some exceptions here. So what's the case with people who are like above uh, average on like, um, let's say it's just language and they're below average on like math, what happens then? Yeah, that's what we're gonna talk about, oh. right? So this is just a general theory in that it's applicable to most people. But the important part is to know is it doesn't apply to all people, all right? So that doesn't mean that I either get everything or I don't as far as high intelligence goes, but most people do. So for whatever reason, all these interacting circuits that handle my numbers and language expression and spatial ability, et cetera, uh, they all generally come together and they all interact at roughly the same level for whatever reason. That's for most people though, not all people. And the one person that's going to uh, end up uh, Showing that this is not the case is the uh, next guy on the list is the first guy uh, is Howard Gardner Now there, it's important to know there's a guy in between here uh, That Leon Thurston guy we'll talk about him tomorrow with testing He's gonna actually try to disprove this by finding other factors where people score It's very but he actually just ends up Confirming uh, that most people have a general factor of intelligence, but again not for all and In fact actually what's even weirder is the higher your intelligence usually the more variation there is between the factors. So for example, if I've got a, a math super genius, um, like he goes to MIT and he does all this fancy math stuff, uh, he's got off the charts mathematical and numerical ability, but uh, while his language is still gonna be pretty high too, uh, there's a larger gap between his language and his math ability. Same in reverse, if I've got some prolific writer that's uh, an insanely creative writer and understands words and uses language really well. Uh, almost certainly the math ability is also really high, but there's a bigger gap than there would on an average person. So for whatever reason, the more extreme you get, the bigger the gap gets per person. But still, they usually come in packages where all of them are high or all of them are average or all of them are low with, with some variance. However, the uh, uh, major guy that's going to refute this is a guy named Howard Gardner. And um, Again, he can't disprove it. And again, even the guy Thurston that tries to disprove this theory ends up actually confirming it, that most people do just have one factor and all of these circuits operate at roughly the same level and ability. Uh, Howard Gardner does show that there is, there are some instances where this does vary quite a bit. So, uh, for example, like you, who was it that asked the question? Was it, there you go. Uh, what was your point exactly? What about people that are really good with language without math? Or? Um, not like, just like an above average or something and below average. Yeah, okay. And usually the more extreme, the bigger the difference too. So uh, here's one major example. Uh, these are known as uh, savants. I heard somebody say this the other day. I think you said it. Maybe she saw in the notes. Uh, savants are people that are insanely <coughs> high uh, intelligence or ability in one factor. So like, um, who might be a savant that I can think off the top of my head? I, I can only think of like musical savants that just like make great music and they can't do other things very well. That, that actually works though. Okay, hold on. 
Uh, there's an episode of House, I think that's the picture that's on the notes, um, where there's this guy who could play the piano insanely well. He could just hear a song and, and replicate it. He could write his own music. You could ask him to write something he just created out of nowhere. Insane musical ability. So he's very, very uh, apt to like understanding uh, numerical and mathematical patterns and then translating that to uh, uh, music. But uh, he could not do very simple things like brush his teeth and get himself dressed and all that because his uh, intelligence and the other factors was very, very low. His communication was poor as well. <clears throat> but the dude could just hear a song and, blah, and, and make it. So like super high mathematical ability or um, another one called um, um, inductive reasoning where you can kind of hear patterns and recreate them and understand them. Could be either one of those factors. Um, super, super astronomically high, higher than anybody else, but all the other ones were insanely low. Uh, that's what a savant can be, all right? So uh, very high score in uh, one or more factors, right? So it could be language, could be mathematics, could be pattern finding, like uh, inductive reasoning, whatever. Uh, but then they could have, uh, also have low scores in others. What's important to know though is these are the exception to the rule. They're, they're rare. That's why they have their own title as a savant. Like they're kind of incredible as far as their ability in, in, in one category, but not the others. Uh, so rare, Absolutely, but also they do still exist. So does this mean that potentially you don't just get intelligence as a single factor package? Some people are nodding yes. Why? How does that prove that? If this was true for everybody, how does this disprove that specifically? Let's we'll stay with you on this one. Because if there was, um, is there some, okay, so the first one means that there's like a general package, so that means that you would get average scores or pretty high scores on everything, but with mm -hmm. Savant, it's like very high on one thing and everything else as well. So according to other ones, it, everything should be like average. Or right, like, yeah, if I was insanely high on one, that would this would mean, if this was every person, this would mean that all of them would be elevated. And the fact that this can even vary shows that while most people might get them all together, like the circuits all function at roughly the same level, uh, there are exceptions be, uh, because we have these savants. So that does mean that maybe one set of circuits does control your, your language processing or comprehension, prehension, or one circuit or set of circuits does control your uh, inductive reasoning and pattern finding or numerical ability or spatial ability or, or whatever, right? So the fact that this does exist does show that this isn't one single factor where it all comes together. Does it for most people? Yes, but there are some exceptions. Some other exceptions are uh, people on the autism spectrum. Very common for them is they are uh, generally very high, or they can be very high on, I swap a can, not that they all are. Can be very high on math, uh, mathematical ability, numerical and spatial ability. So very, very intelligent. But they really, really struggle with some things uh, such as expressing themselves, maintaining social norms. Um, what else could they struggle with? Uh, basic uh, functions, whether it's fine or gross motor. Uh, my brother works with a lot of these. Um, uh, with, his, with the company he works for. Uh, they basically try to help um, kids on the autism spectrum that are struggling to uh, what's, what's called mainstream, right? Get in the regular classrooms. Uh, they help to try to bridge that gap by teaching them social norms and when not to do things and when to do things and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable and all of that uh, because they can't understand it and comprehend it. Uh, so autism spectrum is a, is a good example of this. They might have low language ability or motor ability or or, or comprehension for uh, other factors, but their math and spatial are off the charts uh, potentially, or at least just uh, average to above average. Um, other examples, uh, you can actually suffer injuries, can uh, hinder one or more factors, uh, but uh, maintain others. So, uh, is there somewhere I could potentially damage in my brain that would hinder my linguistic ability, but still possibly maintain my spatial or mathematic or, pal uh, or a, a pattern finding ability. I will awkwardly stand here until somebody says yes or no. Yes. yes, you actually know the area too. Roca, there we go, or Vernica potentially, right. Yeah, so if I damage those areas, what happens to my language ability? Whoop, goes out the window. Do you think I can still do math and carry myself around in the world? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's possible, right, depending on what was damaged. So 
the fact that these exist show that it's not just one set of circuits that determines everything. It just happens to be that most people come with circuits that function at relatively similar uh, ability levels. All right, so these two are legitimate. Um, do know that this is uh, pretty much universally true, uh, but there are some exceptions, which means it's not an absolute rule. Uh, and that it's very clear that it's not just like, I have all my intelligence in one spot. It's a series of circuits that handle different roles, and they can actually vary uh, in ability. And in fact, the further you go towards the extremes, the, the more um, uh, distance there is between the gaps. It's still small, but like I said, the super math uh, nerds of the world generally are lower in linguistic, and the super uh, writer nerds of the world are generally a little lower uh, in like mathematic ability and stuff like that. Still higher than everybody else, but uh, lower than their super high math or language ability. You guys got that?